All right. So good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome to this week's study on Daniel chapter 11. As we return to where we left off on Thursday, shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance, for his blessing and his direction, so that we may more con completely consider that which we are about to read. Shall we now ask for his watch, care, and guidance in prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for the many blessings that you are providing. We thank you for your directions, your admonitions, and for all that you are showing us for us at this time. May your spirit open our minds. May your angels watch over us. As we meet, as we study, as we discuss these verses, help us now. May your will be done. May we follow it in the path that you would set before us. Forgive us of our sins. Help us now so that our minds may become enlightened. Direct us to this end. For this we thank you and this we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we were leaving off here at about verse 5. And the king of the south shall be strong and one of his princes. And he shall be strong above him and have dominion, and his dominion shall be a great dominion. Now, as we've covered this before, we're recognizing that the king of the south is being denominated here, and the king of the south shall be one of the princes of the Grecian Empire, just as the king of the north is one of the princes of the Grecian Empire. And he, the king of the south, shall be strong above the king of the north, and shall have dominion, and his dominion shall be a great dominion. Now, can we apply it in this way, or should it be applied in a different way? Smith writes, the king of the north and the king of the south are many times referred to in the remaining portion of this chapter. It becomes therefore essential to an understanding of the prophecy to clearly identify these powers. When Alexander's empire was divided, it was divided toward the four winds of heaven, east, west, north, south. These divisions, of course, to be reckoned from the standpoint of Palestine. That division of the empire lying west of Palestine would thus constitute the kingdom of the west. That lying east, the kingdom of the east. That lying north, the kingdom of the north. And that lying south, the kingdom of the south. The divisions of Alexander's kingdom with respect to Palestine are situated as follows. Cassander had Greece and the adjacent countries, which lay to the west. Lysimachus had Thrace, which then included Asia Minor, and the countries lying on the Hellespont and the Bosporus, which lay to the north of Palestine. Ptolemy had Egypt and the neighboring countries, which lay to the south, and Seleucus had Syria and Babylon, which lay principally to the east. So, the way so, that... So, so, go ahead, so, please. So, we talked about this on, on Thursday. So, Seleucus would be the east, but he's going to conquer the north, so he becomes the king of the north, I guess, is the way that Smith looks at this. But then, why is he called the king of the north? It could have been the king of the east and the king of the south. Right. right. There, isn't a, there isn't a logic to it of why it ends up being the king of the north and the king of the south. So uh, I was thinking about this and trying to figure out, okay, exactly. Now, we know we have the four directions of the compass, but we know that the king of the north prior to Daniel is Babylon and Assyria are considered the king of the north, Right. Correct. And that's because we approach Israel from the north. So I would think the reason why it's the king of the north and the king of the south is just, just those are the two directions from which the principal enemies are described as coming from. So I'm, 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 and, and we know that he's setting this up for Daniel 11, uh, verse 40. Right? That's where he's going to you know, pull this card out for that. But yeah, I don't know if the logic really, really even follows. I mean, obviously we know that it changes to spiritual when we get to Daniel, before we get to Daniel 1140. 
but yeah, I don't know if there's a logic here that, that I'd never really thought about before. Because he, well, he doesn't have this in um, in the book thoughts on Daniel, just just in this original publication that he describes this detail. So yeah, yeah, I don't because I never thought about this before, right? I mean, we just sort of oh, I, I would always just think, well, Seleucus must have been the king of the Norse. Uh, but he's going to conquer the northern kingdom. But he's going to also conquer the western kingdom as well, right? All right. Because, I mean, he's, according to what he has here, Seleucus has the east, Syria and Babylon. But Babylon, we would think of as the king of the north. But but he's going to conquer the north, uh, according to how he describes this here. So he's going to describe countries lying on the Hellespont and Bosphorus. And then, He's also going to see here, what does he have? And then he, he's going to conquer Greece. He's going to conquer Lysimachus's or Cassander's. So he's going to conquer Cassander and Lysimachus. Doesn't quite happen exactly in that way, but um, but he's going to conquer that ter territory ultimately. But instead of being called the king of the east or the king of the west, he's going to be called the king of the north. So I, I don't think that that's the reason why. His reasoning is faulty here. I would agree. I mean, if if we look at a at a map, a true map of what's going on, it's for me very interesting because west of Israel, what do you have? West of Israel? Yeah. Well, you got the Mediterranean. And when we go east of Israel, we have Syria, we have Jordan. Yeah, here in no. Jordan. And obviously, uh, Babylon's sort of north and west, or at least in Syria, is Babylon's more just on the west side of that. And of course, uh, Media Persia's, or no, west side, east side of that. And then Media Persia's even further east, Persia is. Well, but yeah, um, I, I just think that we need to see that north and south have to do with the fact that that's how their primary enemies are described. Not so much that these kingdoms lie to the four winds of heaven, right? Okay. Yeah. So, so the Mediterranean is on the west instead yes. of the east. The Mediterranean is, is directly on the west of Israel. I'm just trying to get it pictured in my head. I'm, please forgive me. Not a problem. But um, in the north was be the be uh, in in the Syria area, right? So the north would be Syria, would be Lebanon, and then we would be we'd go further, going north, like to Turkey. Right. Okay. All right. All right. Okay. Thank you, sir. Not a problem, brother. Come on. Okay. But I agree. There's a problem here with the way that that Smith is is pointing this out during the wars and revolutions which for long ages succeeded, these geographical boundaries were frequently changed or obliterated. Old ones were wiped out and new ones instituted. But whatever changes might occur, these first divisions of the empire must determine the names, or we have no standard by which to test the application of the prophecy. That is, whatever power at any time should occupy the territory which at first constituted the kingdom of the north, that power, so long as it occupied the territory, would be the king of the north. And whatever power should occupy that which at first constituted the king of the south, that power would so long be the king of the south. We speak of, of only these two because they are the ones afterwards spoken in the prophecy. And because, in fact, almost the whole of Alexander's empire finally resolved itself into these two divisions. Cassander was very yeah, soon. Uh, Go yeah, ahead. Um, yeah, just uh, so so we know that there is this whole group of people that you know going back to Millerite history, they're going to go back to the pioneers view, and um, so that pioneers view, they're going to take Ezra Smith's view, and yet the logic here doesn't really make sense. So. Uh, the reason why it's north and south is not because that's going to be the principal powers that are later spoken of. 
but because north and south has always been the traditional directions their enemies come from. Correct. Right. So he misses out that reasoning. Um, because, but then they, they symbolize something, right? Egypt symbolizes, in the in Book of Revelation, that's going to be symbolized, like Sodom and Egypt, that's going to be France, right? Right. And then Babylon is going to symbolize the papacy. So that's why we would look at the north and the south later on in Daniel 11, verse 40. North being the papacy, south being what is spiritually represented by Egypt, and that, of course, would be the atheistic aspect. So, yeah, it's it's kind of unfortunate, you know, that Uriah Smith makes this interpretation, but but it, it's not his interpretation. He is repeating what Josiah Litch taught, right? but Josiah Litch just simply taught what Alexander Keith taught. It, it isn't really the pioneer's view completely there. I mean, there are different views. But in this, and I, in, this, in this particular examination by Smith, is he not trying to force the literal applications rather than considering figurative applications? Yeah, well, I, I don't know if he's trying to force it. That's what he understands. But, but it's He's just, he's trying to present what he perceives as the pioneer view. That's the thing I find about Dry Smith. He's, he's not, he's not coming up with his, his own interpretations per se. He's not, you know, trying to find new light. He's actually trying to stay with old light, which I understand. It's just that he's not able to see that there's, there isn't really a united view on this old light. He's taking just, what was taught by Josiah Litch. He's not really differing very much in that way. Okay. Cassander was soon conquered by Lysimachus, and his kingdom, Greece and Macedon, annexed to Thrace. And Lysimachus was in turn conquered by Seleucus, and Macedon and Thrace annexed to Syria. These facts prepare the way for an application of the text before us. The king of the south, Egypt, shall be strong. Ptolemy annexed Cyprus, Phoenicia, Carla, Cyrene, and many other islands and cities to Egypt. Thus was his kingdom made strong. But another of Alexander's princes is introduced in the expression, one of his princes. The Septuagint translates the verse thus, And the king of the south shall be strong, and one of Alexander's princes shall be strong above him. This must refer to Seleucus, who is already stated, having connected Macedon and Thrace to Syria, thus became possessor of three parts out of the four of Alexander's dominion and established for a more powerful kingdom than that of Egypt. Any thoughts here? Okay. Um, yeah, so, I mean, we, we know that we're not going to disagree with some of the things here, but we discussed this, the one of his princes, um, when we were going through this before, and we looked at different options. I'm trying to remember exactly how we, how we address that. And so he's going here, verse six, she shall give up, give up, they shall break about her. Right. So we were, we were looking at there, there was in the Hebrew, um, he that begat her. Now, how does he, that's going to be later, so he's going to be here. I'm just trying to figure this out. The king of the south shall be strong, and one of his princes, so we say that that's going to be Ptolemy the first Soder. Is, that is, the his is Ptolemy the first Soder. One of his princes is Seleucus Gaiter. Okay. We, we had some discussion about this. I just don't remember. Because in my notes, I didn't put the discussion on it. I just put our answer. So he's going to, anyway, he's going to gain the dominion of the territory of Syria, right? Is the way that, that we looked at this, but that doesn't really make sense. Okay, so here's what I have, right, in my, my, my notes that we have on Daniel chapter 11, verse 5 and 6. So in the king of the south, who is Ptolemy the first Soter, shall be strong, and one of his princes, Ptolemy the first Soter, 
uh, or uh, one of his, that is Ptolemy the First Soter's princes, Seleucus the First Nicator, and he, Seleucus the First, shall be strong above him, Ptolemy the First, and have dominion. Gain the territory of Syria. That's what we have written. But he already has the territory of Syria, right? Right. So, so that doesn't make any sense. The way, and, and, and we, we, we had the game of the territory of Syria because that was in um, the brackets and the parentheses as the historical interpretation in um, Swearingen's book, right? So, right. Uh, not instead of the Northeast. But he already has that territory, according to Uriah Smith. So, so he's not going to gain, he would just retain the territory of Syria. And his dominion shall be a great dominion, largest territory of the Hellenistic empires. So we would actually not have him contain, gain the territory of Syria. He would have to gain the territory of, you know, Greece and also the areas north of Israel. So again, it just, it just doesn't really follow. Hmm. So I'm going to have to rethink this again. Because we just kind of assumed, you know, Syria was the north. That's the way that I had assumed it before. But, but he's saying that Syria was part of, of the east, right? Right. It began as part of the east, and then because of the conquerings of Seleucus, then became part of the north. Yeah. So, I mean, we would have to say that, I mean, if we were going to follow his logic, we would have to say that instead of gain the territory of Syria, he would have to gain the territory of the rest of the, ki the kingdom, except for Egypt. And we put the gain of territory of Syria, or Ram, right, would equal the global economy in, in the present truth application. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to have to rethink this. I don't know if I want to rethink it right now. There, there's something that's missing. Yeah, it, this puts a little spanner in the works here from how we were looking at this. There must be, so he shall be strong above him, so it doesn't really make any any sense. The Ptolemy the first, and then one of his princes. So that had to do with the generals, right? So you got Ptolemy. So. Ptolemy is, but he's the king of the south, and one of his princes, that is Seleucus. Okay, so he is going to take and gain the territory of Syria. But we're saying the territory of Syria, at least Uriah Smith is, that that's the part of the east. Okay, so. So Ptolemy is still going to keep the south. So did Ptolemy, the Ptolemy had, what kingdoms did he conquer? Did he have Syria already? No. So he never had Syria at all. Correct. So he's going to gain, he's going to gain it from, not from Ptolemy. So he's going to become greater. Okay. So it's not gaining the territory. But see, we always looked at it, the territory is the territory of Syria. Whoever has that becomes the king of the north, right? That's part of the situation, yes. Yeah, that, that is part of, of how the argument has gone. But Uriah Smith is saying that Syria is actually part of the east. So it's not who gains the territory of Syria. But later on, that's what's going to be argued. Uh, I mean, that's the way that, that I have always understood it. That Syria was... The, the territory, whoever has that territory becomes the king of the north because that's who they're going to be fighting over all the time, right? When they're battle, they're, they're having the battles between the king of the north and the king of the south, they're fighting over the area, the territory of Syria, right? Later on, when we look at these 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 wars, right? Syria and Palestine, but now now Syria, Syria now technically speaking, when you deal with the land of Canaan and Abraham leaves Haran, he's actually going to go into Syria, right? Right. When he leaves, because Haran's actually technically in Babylon. Syria is part of, of, well, it's part of the Levant, right? Sometimes we refer to it as Palestine. You know, I, I guess, how do we define that, that territory? I mean, uh, because Israel, in a sense, it should have inherited all of that territory because uh, what is the territory that was offered to Abraham? That which we would call it. Well, well, no, if you go to uh, Genesis 15, I think it is, right? 
Um, trying to think where it is. That, uh, is it Genesis 15? Yeah. Okay. Genesis 15, 18. On the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. So technically speaking, uh, if we look at the river Euphrates and we look at the river of Egypt, that's if he gets that land. He's actually promised the land of Syria as well, right? Because Syria yes. is on the western side of the Euphrates. Correct. Okay. Now, now it, it, it's now we 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 have the descendants of um, well Edom, Moab, and Ammon on the west side of Israel, or the east side of Israel, right? So Israel is going to take the tor- territory west of that. Now, you know, there's the Jordan, and Israel gets some of that territory that's on the east side of the Jordan, right? You're going to have the half-tribe of Manasseh, and oh, the, the names escape me of the tribes. Dan, and the other one, that's going to be on the east side of the Jordan. Manasseh? The well, half tribe of Manasseh, Dan, and the other tribe, whatever. Is it uh, Simeon? I just can't think. Yeah, Simeon. Yeah, it, it, it's um, the tribe of what? Did I say, I said Simeon. Simeon? No, not Simeon. Simeon's going to be, I don't know why my brain's not working. Okay, let me see here. Is it Reuben then? Yeah, that's it, Reuben. Yeah, so Reuben. Dan, Reuben, no, it's not, and it's not Dan, it's Reuben, who is it? So Dan was wrong. <laughs> Gad, that's it. Gad, then Reuben, and the half tribe of Manasseh, right? Does that, that mm-hmm. not make sense? Yeah. Then you're going to have, I'm just trying to find a map here of this. Why can't I find one with the different, uh, yeah, so we get okay. Gad. Manasseh, Gad, and Reuben. Yeah. And and uh, the one furthest to the north is going to be Reuben, Manasseh. right? No, so, and it's Manasseh. Man, oh, Manasseh is going to have more of the north? Yes. Reuben is going to be further south because it's more toward uh, the land of Moab. Gad is kind of central because it's closer to the, the land of Ammon. Okay, yeah. Okay, that makes sense now. Because yeah, we went through all this before, but remember all those details. Okay. So you got Manasseh, Gad, and then Reuben. And and Gad and Reuben, they asked for that territory prior to them crossing into uh crossing the Jordan, right? Right. Um and they are involved in conquering the territory on the west side of the Jordan with the other tribes. And then they come back and obtain their inheritance afterwards so after they conquer the land right that's how we we understand right it. okay so um so they do have some of that territory that we would call jordan and syria now and, and israel later doesn't um like modern israel it doesn't actually have any of that territory anymore but originally it was part of their territory right so when, when they became a nation in 1948, right? They didn't get uh, any of Jordan or Syria, right? They're just, everything in in the nation of Israel is going to be on the west side of the Jordan. But that wasn't how it originally was. Okay. Yeah. So um, when you look at this, then, I'm just looking at a map here of of this territory. Because you've got uh, Bashan and Gilead. That's going to be so Israel has quite a bit of territory, actually, on the east side of the Jordan originally. And Syria is pushed up further to the north, above the territory that was Manasseh's territory. Right. And the kingdom of Jordan, Ammon, and all that territory that's now called Jordan. Uh, some of that area of Jordan is occupied by Gad and Reuben. So Israel's actually smaller than the territory that was given it uh, by Abraham, and that was originally conquered by Israel after they left Egypt. So if you look at Syria or Aram, it's it's actually really to the north, not really to the east 
of Israel. Right. Okay. Now, as the Bible continues, and in the end of years, they shall join themselves together. For the king's daughter of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement. But she shall not retain the power of the arm, neither shall he stand, nor his arm. But she shall be given up, and they that brought her, and he that begat her, and he that strengthened her in these times. Smith continues, there were frequent wars between the kings of Egypt and Syria. Especially was this the case with Ptolemy Philadelphus, the second king of Egypt, and Antiochus Theos, third king of Syria. They at length agreed to make peace upon condition that Antiochus Theos put away his former wife, Laodice, and her two sons, and should marry Berenike, the daughter of Ptolemy Philadelphus. Ptolemy accordingly brought the daughter to Antiochus, bestowing with her an immense treasure of a as a dowry. But she shall not retain the power of the arm that is, her interest and power with Antiochus. And so it proved, for some time after, in a fit of love, Antiochus brought back his former wife, Laodice, Laodice and her children to court again. <clears throat> then says the prophecy, neither shall he, Antiochus, stand, nor his arm, or his seed. Laodice, being restored to favor and power, feared lest, in the fit fickleness of his temper, <clears throat> Antiochus should again disgrace her and recall Berenike. And conceiving that nothing short of his death would be an effectual safeguard against such a contingency, she caused him to be poisoned shortly after. Neither did his seed by Berenike succeed him in the kingdom. For Laodice so managed affairs as to secure the throne for her eldest son, Seleucus Hellenius. But she, Berenike, shall be given up. Laodice, not content with poisoning her husband, Antiochus, caused Berenike to be murdered. And they that brought her, her Egyptian women in attendance, in endeavoring to defend her, were many of them slain with her. And he that begat her, margin whom she brought forth that is her son who was murdered at the same time by the order of laodice and he that strengthened her in these times her husband antiochus as jerome supposes or those who took her part and defended her but such wickedness could not long remain unpunished as prophecy further predicts and history further proves any comment okay um yeah i'm going through this and trying to so I was I'm looking at actually um, the commentary uh, of Daniel and Revelation by Uriah Smith. Now I'm having trouble seeing your screen. Oh, it's finally showed up because yeah, I disconnected. Okay, so he he changes a few things, but principally it's much the same. Now we had discussed this in detail, and where we had some of the differences or where we discussed this. Now, we know in they're going to join themselves together, right? And, and we have, they conclude peace in 252 BC uh, for the king's daughter, the Berenice, daughter of Ptolemy II, of the south shall come to the king of the north, and Tyke is the second Theos. And, and it's always about Syria here, right? So, of course, we're, we're noting that where he had said that Syria was the east, but really it's the territory that's being addressed as the north but anyway to make an agreement so there's this peace through this marriage alliance the chi berenice shall not retain the power of the arm she loses her position from the former queen laodice and the word laodice means decision of the people and then uh neither shall he that is in Tychus the second stand because he's going to be assassinated by laodice nor his arm which is refers to his military power, but she, Berenice, shall be given up, executed by Laodice, and they that brought her. Now, this is where we had the difference. So there's 
the ones that brought her, the execution of her attendants also. And then it says in the King James, and he that begat her, but really it's one whom she begat, right? So, um, so he's going to have here whom she brought forth, that is her son, and he that strengthened her in these times. And uh, so he's going to say the ones that strengthened her in these times was her husband, Antiochus. Now he has here, as Jerome, Jerome supposes, that's taken out of the book, uh, like in the book Daniel Revelation. He just says, obviously, he says exactly in that sentence there, he says, doubtless her husband, that is saying it as Jerome, Jerome supposes. So, which is a little stronger to say, doubtless her husband, we don't have any doubt. But he says, as Jerome supposes, that's a supposition. But anyway. Antiochus, or those who took uh, her part and defended her. And so I guess maybe that's, that doesn't make sense. Okay, I see what he's doing. So that was her husband, right? So he just, he just says her husband, Antiochus. And then as Jerome supposes is for those who took, I'm not sure if as Jerome supposes, now that must be with Antiochus. Or is Jerome supposing those who took her part and defended her? It's not clear. And um, anyway, so that that was uh, we we discussed that for a while before. But anyway, the main the main thing I think that we're we're trying to bring out here is not so much uh, we're not going to look at the present truth application here, just this historic application. But the, but the issue here becomes they're fighting over this territory of Syria, right? That correct. And, and Syria, Syria is, is to the north, not to the east. So, but, but initially, uh, Syria is going to be part of the eastern division of Alexander's kingdom. So, if we if we get this straight, I know we keep belaboring this point and looking at it, but um, the idea that it's the king of the north really has to do with containing or, or obtaining the kingdom of Syria. Initially, when in, in the initial application, the kingdom of the north is Syria. Syria is not part of the east. So, but, but initially, the eastern kingdom has Syria. So, it's not called the kingdom of the north because it, it has the kingdom of Syria. Right? That's what we're deciding? Right. Because initially part that has the kingdom of Syria is actually the east. Now it's going to become the king, like like literally, but it is actually the king of the north because the east actually has Syria, but it, it, it's the king of the north because it has Syria, not because it's, because it's, because it's, it is the eastern kingdom, but it's still called the king of the north. Is that making sense? Is anybody confused? It's just his original, reasoning is faulty in, in the sense of north, south, east, and west. But it is true that whoever has Syria is the king of the north. So that's I probably just, why I understand that. that. It's, it's, I understand. Okay, okay good. I'm, I'm having a hard time thinking here this morning. I guess I'm a little tired. Smith's position <laughs> as it is just a little bit convoluted. Well, it, it, it's, it, it he has a logic there that he's not he's not consistent with right yeah and but it, it can, you can easily just slip over it and not notice it if you don't pay attention okay now this is the end of this part of, of his articles now we've got another one to go to so here published on the 10th of january of 1871 we come in and he starts with the first three verses of or the next three verses of Daniel 11. But out of a branch of her roots shall one stand up in his estate, which shall come with an army and shall enter into the fortress of the king of the north, and shall deal against them and shall prevail, and shall also carry captives into Egypt their gods and their princes and with their precious vessels of silver and gold. And he shall continue more years than the king of the north. So the king of the south shall come into his kingdom and shall return to his own land. The branch out of the same root with Berenike was her brother, Ptolemy 
your Gites. He had no sooner succeeded his father, Ptolemy Philadelphus, in the kingdom of Egypt, than burning to avenge the death of his sister, Berenike, he raised an immense army and invaded the territory of the king of the north, that is, of Seleucus, who with his mother, Laodice, Laodice, reigned in Syria. And he prevailed against them, even to the conquering of Syria, Cilicia, and the upper parts of the Euphrates, and almost all of Asia. But hearing that a sedition was raised in Egypt, requiring his return home, he plundered the kingdom of the Solomonans, took 40,000 talents of silver and precious vessels, and 2,500 images of the gods. Among these were the images which Cambyses had formerly taken from Egypt and carried into Persia. The Egyptians, being wholly given to idolatry, bestowed upon Ptolemy the title of Eurgetes, or the benefactor, as a compliment for his having thus, after many years, restored their captive gods. Yeah, so that word there, Solon, Solonins, that's just yeah. a typo, because it's Seleucus. Okay. Um, I don't know, just somehow, probably the print wasn't good, and so in interpreting the, the text. Okay. So that's good. Seleucus in the original. Okay. I actually have here Seleucus Kalinicus. Uh, how they get okay. T-U-S-E-L-E-U-C-U-S okay sorry E-U-C-U-S there's no in there okay. okay so I mean we don't really have problems with his interpretation of this though just uh, okay so in this situation according to Bishop Newton is Jerome's account extracted from ancient historians but there are authors still extant, he says, who confirm several of the same particulars. Appian infor informs us that Leodice, having killed Antiochus, and after him both Berenike and her child Ptolemy, the son of Philadelphia, to revenge those murders, invaded Syria, slew Leodice, and proceeded as far as Babylon. From Polybius, we learn that Ptolemy, surnamed Eugites, being greatly incensed at the cruel treatment of his sister, Bernike, marched with an army into Syria and took the city of Seleucia, which was kept for some years afterwards by the garrisons of the kings of Egypt. Thus did he enter into the fortress of the king of the north. Polyenus, which there again may be a typo, affirms that Ptolemy made himself master of all the counter from Mount Taurus to as far as India without war or battle, but he ascribes it by mistake to the father instead of to the son. Justin asserts that if Ptolemy had not been recalled by a domestic sedition into Egypt, he would have possessed the whole kingdom of Seleucus. The king of the south thus came into the dominion of the king of the north, and returned to his own land as the prophet had foretold. And he also continued more years than the king of the north, for Seleucus Callinicus died in exile of a fall from his horse, and Ptolemy Eurgetes survived him for four or five years. Any thoughts? Well, that one typo there, just it should be uh, an A in there instead of, so A-E instead of E, Paulinus. Okay. okay, verse 10. But his son shall be stirred up and shall assemble a multitude of great forces. And one shall certainly come and overflow and pass through. Then shall he return and be stirred up even unto his fortress. The first part of this verse speaks of sons in the plural, the last part of one in the singular. The sons of Seleucus Callinicus were Seleucus Seranius and Antiochus Magnus. These both entered with zeal upon the work of vindicating and avenging the cause of their father and their country. The elder of these, Seleucus, first took the throne. He assembled a great multitude to recover his father's dominions, but being a weak and 
pusillanimous prince, both in body and estate, destitute of money and unable to keep his army in obedience, he was poisoned by two of his generals after an inglorious reign of two or three years. His more capable brother, Magnus, was thereupon proclaimed king, who, taking charge of the army, retook Seleucia and recovered Syria, making himself master of some places by treaty and of others by force of arms. A truce followed, wherein the sides treated for peace, yet prepared for war, after which Antiochus returned and overcame in battle Nicholas, the Egyptian general, and had thoughts of invading Egypt itself. itself. Here is the one who should certainly overthrow and pass through. Thoughts? Okay. So, yeah, yeah. Um, just going over this, because I'm looking at our notes that we had going through this. So we know that um, uh, Antiochus the Third Magnus, he's going to, um, when he overflows and overflow and pass through, that, that becomes a symbol of the Sunday law, obviously that, that symbolism there. But this is going to be the fourth Syrian war that's going to begin, right? Okay. And uh, now Antiochus, then he's he's going to be the one that returns to Syria, returns and shall be stirred up even to his uh, fortress. And here it was important because of how we looked at the present truth application that this fourth Syrian war, uh, we have their Sunday law with a quotation mark in red as the present truth application. And then he, that is Antiochus III, which would be republicanism, returns to Syria, the USA, and stirred up even unto his fortress. That's the American Constitution, is the fortress. So, so when we look at all of this, these are going to be these conflicts between the Republican Party and the Democratic Party, and, and also Biden and Trump as well. So these initial, I mean, when we look at, these battles. So when we're looking at it from this biblical perspective of, of why this history is being told. So we, we, we believe that Daniel chapter 11 is uh, in the historical application. There's a reason why this is given. And that reason has to do with an understanding of the 2520. That's what we're saying. And then we're having this, this period of division of the Greek empire. And it's not particularly addressing Israel, right? This is about battles in Syria or over the territory of Syria initially, and then battles between Egypt and Syria. Now, Israel's involved in the sense that it's kind of caught in the middle between these two places. But the reason that we have this, this, these battles of the king of the north and the king of the south, we now understand is because they're going to be typical, right? Right. That is, these battles of the king of the north and the king of the south don't really matter in in the context of of Israel, except that they have this typical nature. So that's the only reason why this north and south battles are represented. I mean, obviously, we can look at the book of Daniel and we can see that it fulfills history. So it's setting up something, but the battles themselves aren't addressing God's people, right? I mean, Israel's in between that, but these aren't battles between these kingdoms and the land of Israel. So so it's only the typical nature of these battles that matter. And then that's going to matter with the typical nature of that when we get to the antitype. And the antitype of these battles between the king of the north and the king of the south are when we get to Daniel 11, verse 40. So there's this major difference between how we're looking at Daniel chapter 11 and how Uriah Smith is looking at it. And if we were to follow his logic, that is, if we're going to just think that this is about battles between the king of the north and the king of the south, and, and he's going to continue following that up in his interpretation of Daniel 11, you, you know, beginning with verse 36, uh, where he differs by saying that that's, that's going to be France that's introduced. It becomes really a very different prophecy. And, 
and, and it doesn't really follow that we should, it, it, it's almost, it's almost a type of preterism, right? Instead of a historicism, right? That you're looking for, now he avoids, you know, having the entire kiss epiphanies, fulfilling some of the, the prophecy that we, that we understand is the papacy that's dealing with Rome, right? He's going to have, he's going to agree with us there. But really, it, it's, he's retaining some of the ideas of preterism. That is, that you have to have it consistent with this historical application, that this was history that was fulfilled. It, and it doesn't really make sense to jump to our time at all, right? If, if he was internally consistent, uh, there would be no reference to our time. Right? It's like he's borrowing some things from you know, the Antiochus of Epiphanes view, uh, but trying to retain some ideas from the historicist interpretation of prophecy, right? Because preterism is where you're going to say all of this is fulfilled in the past. But he's actually setting himself up to be inconsistent when he tries to move this into Millerite history to make the time at the end to be do you understand what I'm saying? So when he says the time of the end of 1798 later on, well, that's actually the inconsistence with how he's been setting this up. And, and of course, he's not the one that did it. It's Alexander Keith that does it. So Alexander Keith is the one that's been inconsistent. But Uriah Smith falls into that, that pattern. Is that making sense to people? I mean, I'm just getting my mind around it myself. So In a lot of this, that Smith is relying upon Keith is... Indirectly, indirectly, of course. Indirectly, yet yeah. it is yet not following Miller's rules. Right, yeah. Now, now I want to get back to a point here, just dealing with um, the pioneer understanding of Daniel chapter 11. So when you type something like the King of the South into Ellen White, or the you know, the, the LNG white disc that has the words of the Adventist pioneers. So you go to that side of it. Right. You're not going to see it. You're not going to see any of the pioneer authors. Like you're not going to see William Miller talking about this. Um, and Josiah Litch is going to be one that talks about it. Right. So you're going to have, it's Josiah Litch's interpretation of Daniel chapter 11 that Uriah Smith is following. So it's not like this united view of the pioneers. Okay, so Josiah Litch is the first one that shows up referring to the King of the South, right? Referring to Daniel chapter 11. So we have his interpretation. So I'm just clicking through this. So it's all going to be Josiah Litch in his book, The Probability of the Second Coming of Christ, about the year 1843. He's going to address chapter uh, 11. And and to go through, it's all just I Litch. I'm just clicking through all of these things. Now, Miller is going to address it a bit. Okay. So, evidences from scripture and history on the second coming of Christ about the year 1843 and of his personal reign. Um, so, he's going to address uh, parts of it. I'm just, so, when he gets to verse 40, He's, uh, here's what uh, Miller is going to say. So, uh, but Miller's, and at the time of the end, what's that? Okay, I'm, I'm looking at this right now in detail <clears throat> because Miller begins to address this in 1833. Himes comes out to address it in 1840. Yeah. Litch in 1841. Okay, yeah, because Himes does as well. Right, so we got Lich and Hines. Um, but as far as when you get to verse 40, when you get to Miller, he's going to say, um, and at the time of the end, so the king of the south push up him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, with horsemen, and many ships, etc. It will be necessary for the reader to observe and for me to remark in this place that the inspired writers in the descriptions of kingdoms or principal governments the pronouns he or him instead of naming them as in the preceding description of antichrist as paul uses in second thessalonians 2 verse 7 
many other places might be named. Therefore, I understand the pronouns in the above named 40th verse and those following in the chapter to refer to the same kingdom or principal ruler of said kingdom and that the angel has reference to the principal kingdom of the ten kingdoms into which the Roman was divided when Antichrist arose. So he has the hymn as being the Antichrist of Second Thessalonians chapter 2, right? So if we're going to take Miller, Miller's view, it's not going to agree with Uriah Smith's view. But, but it, it, is, it is not quite exactly the same as our view either, right? So he's going to have the king of the south being Spain, pushing it for France. And the king of the north, Great Britain, shall come against France like a whirlwind. So he he's kind of getting Miller's Miller's doesn't make any sense either. Well, as I'm as I'm right. looking, so he, has, he has, so he has quite a different view. Um, so he's going to have France in there as well, but he's not going to have um, right. So when he has the king that does according to his will. He's he's going to have this as being the papacy, right? So he's not going to go back in verse 36. He's not going to have this power that exalts itself above every god. He's not going to have it be uh, France, as Uriah Smith does. So he's still going to have this as being the papacy. Uh, but he's just going to have it. He's not going to have him being the king of the north. That's all. That's the difference. Does that make sense? So, so he's going to still have that. We're going to have this. Let me see. If if we go back here, I I, I want to read this just so that we can see clearly that that there isn't this united view that the pioneers had, and that Miller did not have this view that you know Joshua V. Hines had and Josiah Lich had. So in verse 36, it says, And the king shall do according to his will, right? shall exalt himself, etc. The king spoken of in this verse is the little horn in allusion to the papal power which should exalt himself sitting in the place of God above all the heathen gods and even oppose the God of gods by dispensing with his laws and claim the prerogative of making new laws for his kingdom. And also Antichrist will prosper until the indignation be accomplished or judgment of the great day, right? So he doesn't understand the indignation properly for some reason. Anyway, neither shall he regard the God of his fathers nor the desire of women, right? So he says that he is papal Rome, would not regard the pagan gods and would forbid to marry, nor regard the Christian God, but would exalt himself above all that is called God. It says, see Second Thessalonians 2 verse 4. And then in verse 38, but in his estate shall he honor the God of forces and the God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold, silver, and precious stones and pleasant things. Papacy erects her images of pictures of saints and adorns them with precious stones set in gold and silver, which things the fathers were commanded not to worship and which things neither the Jews, Christians, nor pagans had ever before worshipped. Verse 39, thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory and shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. Truly, it is a strange God to, to set up in the most public places images adorned with jewels, etc., for the populace to know, to bow down and worship. But it is well-known fact that in all countries where the power of the papacy is felt, these images are placed in the corners of the streets and all public places and worship is rendered by every passing votary. And it is also true that Pope has sold kingdoms and countries and divided the land to fill his coffers with gain. And in verse 40, and at the time of the end, what way may we understand by the time of the end? I understand at the end of the 1260 years which Antichrist was to reign over the kings of the earth and the tread and tread the church underfoot for the end of the power of the, the character which Gabriel had been describing in the last four verses, the four last verses, which year and power ended, as we shall presently show in the year AD 1798, we will follow the angel in his prophecy. And then it continues on verse 40, and at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, 
and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen, with many ships. Right? So he is going to say, it will be necessary for the reader to observe and for me to remark in this place that the inspired writers, in their descriptions of kingdoms or principal governments, use the pronouns, he or him, instead of naming them, as in the preceding description of Antichrist, or as Paul uses in Second Thessalonians 2, verse 7, and many other places might be named. Therefore, I understand the pronouns, the above-named 40th verse, and those following in the chapter to refer to the same kingdom or principal ruler in said kingdom and that the angel has reference to the principal kingdom of the ten horns into which the Roman was divided when Antichrist arose, which shall hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her and burn her with fire. Revelation 17, verse 12 to 16. If this is correct, then France is intended by he or him in this prophecy in order then to give my view, the reader will if this is correct, then France is intended by he or him in this prophecy. In order that then to give my view, the reader may permit me to paraphrase these few remaining verses. So here's his paraphrase. At the time of the end of Antichrist, shall the king of the south, Spain, push at France, uh, and the king of the north, Great Britain, shall come against France like a whirlwind, with chariots, with horsemen, with many ships. And the French, or Bonaparte, the principal ruler, shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and flow and pass over. So it, it doesn't actually make sense what Miller is saying here, because he, he's arguing that it should the he and the him should refer to the papacy, but then he just switches midstream, so to speak, and then says the he and the him is France. Does that make sense? The application that Father Miller is making does not make sense. Yeah. You're so quite direct about about what is happening here. Yeah. So so if he had followed consistently, he would have he would have had I mean at the most he could have had the King of the North and the King of the South coming against uh the papacy, right? Because the he at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him. Well he he says the hymn refers to the Antichrist or to the papacy, right? But now he's going to say the king of the south is Spain, but pushes at France. Now, I, I, and I, I keep reading this over and trying to figure out why he does that interpretation. So he, he's trying to argue that the, refer to the same kingdom or principal ruler in said kingdom. So I guess because France conquers... I, I think his logic is because France conquers the papacy, France becomes, it takes over this, this power of the papacy. Because the papacy has ended. So I guess this would be Miller's logic. The papacy has ended. It's ended by France, right? And since France now takes over the him aspect of what the papacy was, but what Miller hasn't really done is he hasn't we should have the papacy as the king of the north, right? Because the papacy has conquered that territory it, earlier on in, in Daniel chapter 11. So, so Miller misses this, but it's, it's definitely not the view of Uriah Smith, right? To have Spain as the king of the south, and, and Miller has here the king of the north being Great Britain, right? So now, you know, we would say, okay, we're going to take the pioneer's view on, on many things. Now, if we have a view that we say, well, Miller was wrong about this. Um, one is he's not following his rules. But part of it has to do, and when we, when we looked at this in the past, part of the problem has to do with the fact that they're, they're trying to fit this in to present events the idea that Christ is coming back in 1843, right? So there is no way that Miller could interpret this correctly when you when you have Christ coming back in 1843, because you have the king of the, the south pushing at the king of the north, right, pushing at him. And then we know that the king of the north shall come against him. That's going to be 1989. Now, a question I have then, 
So we know that Christ could have come before this. So all that would mean is that what we had happened in 1989 would have happened earlier, right? Right. That is, it would have happened in, in Adventist history. So it, we don't know how it would have been fulfilled, but you still would have had to have to have a second time at the end, right? Correct. After 1844. So all of the things that happened finally in 1989. So you would have had a, a different power that was the king of the South instead of the Soviet Union, because the Soviet Union would never have formed if Christ had come at the time. Ellen White said that Christ could have come, you know, 1863 or whatever year we want to say that it would have been. So it would have been fulfilled in a different way, but still it would have been uh, the king of the North um, would have come against the king of the South. So the king of the South would have been a different power than the Soviet Union. So it's it's hard to say how that would have would have been fulfilled. Hmm. What ifs are, are difficult and big questions, but you know, the if questions, what if it was different? Well, it would have been different. We just don't know how it would have been different. Because we've already seen that it's been built into the prophecy that there are these two, two times of the ends before we even get to verse 40. So uh, all I'm saying is that Miller could not have interpreted this correctly if you have Christ coming back in 1843. Right? So, so we know that Miller did miss out many things. Now, Uriah Smith, he's trying to preserve what he calls the pioneer view, right? or maybe he doesn't call it that, but what he sees as being the pioneer view when he's writing thoughts on Daniel and Revelation. He's not trying to get, come up with some new interpretation. We see that all through Smith. He's trying to retain what was. He's conservative in that sense, right? He's trying to conserve the view that led us to 1844. But he's not taking into account that, well, one is when we live, right? So he's trying to see, he, he He's taking that account as it was understood by the pioneers, and then he's trying to interpret it because when we look at his 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 new light, let's say he has, he's going to believe that there's going to be this war with Turkey, right? The, right, right, and and that his his predictions don't pan out. Uh, I've had these discussions on Facebook and people who want to retain Uriah Smith's Daniel and Revelation is inspired. And, and it doesn't pan out. It, what he predicts is going to happen does not occur. Now, they try to say, well, it did occur, and it's part of the First World War, and so forth. And I've looked at that long ago in the past as well, trying to make sense out of it. So, I mean, there is some truth in it. There is, there is connections to what ha happens with the fall of Turkey and so forth. But it doesn't result in all of the events that Uriah Smith predicts that are going to be connected with the second coming of Christ. So uh, we know that this interpretation is wrong, that you can't have three powers here, the king of the north, the king of the south, and France. But Miller's is, is quite a bit different than uh, Uriah Smith. So, yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting. I mean, we, we don't need to keep dwelling on on this wrong interpretation. I mean, because we know what the true interpretation is of verse 40. But we can see that Uriah Smith has missed things. And and Miller is going to miss some things as well, right? So it's not like Uriah Smith, you know, created these problems. And I guess if you think about it, because we've, we've made this argument regarding the 2520, that, that it has been hidden, right? And the main problem that Uriah Smith has in interpreting this part of Daniel, Daniel's last vision, is he doesn't see the 2520. And because he doesn't see the 2520, he doesn't have the answer. Now, this movement is founded upon an understanding of Daniel 11, verse 40 to 40, uh, 40 to 45, right? Correct. Now, we had that understanding prior to Understanding the 2520, correct? Correct. Okay. Yet, 
it led us to the understanding of the 2520, correct? Yes. And so we can see how these things are necessarily connected, that the understanding of the 2520 would have given you, Rye Smith, the correct understanding of Daniel chapter 11. He, he would have, you know, we also know that Louis F. Weir, an Australian evangelist, did get the correct interpretation of Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45, to a large degree, right? There are some differences, but definitely in Daniel 11, verse 40, he's going to see that the king of the north is the papacy, the king of the south is the Soviet Union. He's not going to connect it to a secondary time at the end, right? Is he's not going to take Daniel 11, verse 40a as the 1798, which he does, he takes that as 1798, but also take Daniel 11, verse 40b as 1989, right? He's not going to say that when this happens, when the Soviet Union falls, that's going to be a time of the end for this generation. So he doesn't have that. That's going to be given to us in 1989 through Jeff, that he's going to see that there's a secondary time of the end for this generation in verse 40b. And and that's going to lead this movement to, to give the first angel's message. And that first angel's message is going to lead us to 9-11. And then we're, when the second angel's message arrives, we're going to have this understanding of the 25-20 occur, right? And so it, it's interesting, you know, this, this basic premise that we've used in Daniel's last vision, and it that it's meant to give an understanding of the 25-20. Well, in our time, that's what it does. Because Daniel represents God's people at the end of the world, correct? Yes. As a prophet. And so, but he's, he's going to get an understanding of the 25-20, right? And its connection with the 2300 days. Right. But that's not going to be understood in its fullness until our time. So Miller obviously had an understanding of the 2520, had an understanding of the prophetic periods, but only as they related to Millerite history, not as they related to our history. And that's where he's, he's not going to be able to interpret Daniel 11 verse 40 uh, correctly because he's only going to be brought to Millerite history. Does that make sense? I would think so. So there's nothing wrong with saying, well, Miller was wrong here. It's not like we're re we're, we have new light and we're rejecting old light. We're just simply saying that there is a limit to where Miller's understanding could lead him because of the time in which he's living. Does, does that seem logically consistent? I would think so. Yeah. So, so, so there shouldn't be a problem in saying we can't take Miller's or the pioneer's understanding of Daniel 11 verse 40 to 45 as that if we reject that we've rejected you know old light because there's no way that he could have had the correct light on those verses right because he didn't have any light on the sunday law he didn't have light on several points that are now coming very clear to us right because he didn't see beyond 1843 right so so that and that's not that's not saying that miller was his you know, we I've kind of said, well, he didn't follow Miller's rules. In a sense, he did, but Miller's rules could only bring him so far because of where he was. He was in the time of the Millerites. He wasn't in our time. There's no way that he could have seen that if he believed that Christ was coming in 1843. If he believes Christ is coming in 1843, he's not going to be looking to a fulfillment that's going to be a hundred and some years later, right? Right. Okay. So hopefully that, that makes sense, going through this, why, why this is important. So there can be a way in which a person is trying to retain old truths, such as Uriah Smith is always trying to do, but we can miss out on new light in trying to do that. That is, we need to understand that there is an unfolding of truth and that some details that we have in the pioneers' writings uh, 
are not in cor- are, are not correct that they need to be expanded upon and seen more clearly right because we always say that new light is not a rejection of the old but is an unfolding of it it makes old light shine brighter and yet we know that some of the old light has the details that obviously cannot be true right when uh, James and Ellen White that they you know recognized that and that, that Miller had the correct understanding of prophecy, but he was wrong in interpreting the the sanctuary to be the earth that was going to be cleansed. It's not a rejection of old light, right? Where Ellen White isn't saying Miller was wrong, and you know we we're rejecting old light, and we have new light that's rejecting old light. There was an unfolding of light that helped him to see that the earth was not the sanctuary, but it was the heavenly sanctuary that was going to be cleansed at the prophetic periods. But that's consistent, right? It's not inconsistent. I know our time is up, but I I think that's the main thing that we would have to gather from this as we look at how do we understand Uriah Smith being incorrect when he's trying to present the pioneers' views? Because there's so many people who just think you have to retain the pioneers' views on everything, even when they're they're contradicted in the spirit of prophecy. They, they 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 paint themselves into a corner. Okay. Well, it's it, it's like those that would believe that again Smith being quote inspired that everything that he's saying needs to be accepted. Yeah, and of course he's not living in our time, and he's making applications of these prophecies to his time, which, you know, obviously we would have to see that these apply to our time. Now, one thing that we don't do is we don't say, you know, the 1335 days, that was that was fine for their day, but we're going to have a modern application of the 1335, right? We're, we're going to reject all kinds of fulfillments of prophecy. The, the clear way that we look at this is that um, these prophetic periods are correct. The 1843 and the 1850 chart are correct. There are things that we didn't see, but what we understand now actually makes the old understanding clearer, right? It doesn't. It doesn't say we were all wrong about, you know, yeah, Revelation 9, for instance, which modern adventism has just thrown away revelation 9 as having anything to do with islam right right and they're gonna or if they are gonna apply it to islam they're gonna apply it directly to islam some futurists will do it that way um but what what they're doing is they're rejecting historicism and how historicism unfolds as events are fulfilled right that is Until we have a fulfillment of an event, we actually are not going to fully understand it. Even even these things connected with the Sunday law and so forth. We know that there's a Sunday law coming, but exactly how that's going to come about is not going to be seen until we get into that time. And now we are in the time of the Sunday law since 9-11, but people were expecting something different, right? So... And we don't have time to go into it. We can cut, get into that tomorrow. But uh, there's some things I want to say, but it's going to take too long. Okay. So any other comments or questions today? Shall we then close with prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we have had to consider Scripture, to wrestle with Scripture, to consider points as they relate to what we are seeing now. Direct us now through this day. Help us so that that which is done may be to your glory. May your will be done. May our lives represent you in all things so that your character, your name, is glorified in all that we do. For this we thank you and for this we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.